Hello, the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer was born in Danzig in eastern Germany in 1788. His central idea was that everything in the world is fundamentally united by a will to live. Its two key features are that it is infinite and meaningless and leads to boredom or suffering. The only escape from this, he argued, comes through self-denial or art, preeminently music. This pessimistic worldview carried Schopenhauer's influence well beyond philosophy. To discuss the philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer, I'm joined by Beatrice Han Pyle, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Essex. And Beatrice Han Pyle, um, what did he find in Kant that was attractive? Well, uh, he particularly liked Kant's epistemology, his theory of knowledge, and the distinction that Kant introduced between, on the one hand, the phenomenal world and the noumenal world on the other. So the phenomenal world is a world as we perceive it through time, space, and as organized by the law of causality. Uh, and phenomena are all the things that are in it. So Melvin, you're a phenomenon, I'm a phenomenon as well. So to take an example, um, I'm sitting on a chair, I'll perceive that uh, in space as an extended object, in time as something that is here now, and as part of a network of causes and effects. For example, I'm sitting on it because I moved it. So the phenomenal world is really the world as it is dependent on a set of perceptual conditions, time and space, and conceptual conditions, the law of causality. That's really Schopenhauer's version of Kant, because in Kant it's slightly different, but the main uh, distinction is the same. So the question arises of what would happen if these conditions were bracketed. And one way uh, to think about this is to imagine uh, time, space, and causality as a pair of glasses, so to speak, that would be hard wide on us. So everything we see, we have to uh, see as mediated through time, space, and causality. And the question is, what would happen if uh, these glasses were somehow removed? Would it be the case that there would be nothing, that everything would disappear? Now, Schopenhauer follows Kant uh, in saying that, no, this would not happen. What we would have is the world as it is in itself, independently from perceptual and conceptual conditions. Uh, that's what he calls the noumenal uh, world. But just in the same way as without the glasses, we wouldn't be able to see the phenomenal world. In the same way, uh, we cannot know anything about the noumenal world. We can say that it exists, but no uh, knowledge of it uh, is possible. The noumenal world is things like, is there a God, does God exist, things that cannot be, cannot be proved. Yes, well, it's um, rather, it's, uh, these are questions that one, uh, metaphysical questions that uh, could be answered if we knew about the essence of things, uh, and in particular, indeed, whether there is a God, whether we have a soul, uh, whether the world has an end, that sort of thing. But the, uh, the idea for Kant, and that's where Schopenhauer actually differs from it, but the idea for Kant is that these questions are unanswerable uh, because there's no uh, empirical basis on which we could form appropriate knowledge uh, which would give us answers. But Schopenhauer challenged that. That was his disagreement with Kant. Indeed. On what grounds did he challenge it? How well, could we know about the unknowable as far as he is concerned? Right, okay. Uh, what ground? I think it's because he thinks that although Kant secures the possibility of empirical knowledge, in particular through the sciences, that leaves out exactly the sort of questions that we were talking about. And these, to him, are the most important ones. You know, what's the essence of the world? Why is there suffering? What's the meaning of human life? So uh, he f tried very hard to bypass what's often called the Kantian prohibition, the impossibility of knowing the in itself. And he found a rather intriguing way, uh, which starts with the observation that uh, our bodies ha are very uh, ambiguous objects. Uh, on the one hand, they are uh, phenomena, empirical objects like everything else. So if I look at my hand, I see it as extended in space. I could calculate its position uh, compared to a table, compared to a microphone and so forth. There's nothing different uh, with, uh, say, the microphone itself. Uh, and that's representational knowledge. On the other hand, I also have, he says, this inner access to my body. So I know where my hand is in space without any calculation. I know what it feels to have a hand, I'm, as opposed to having a foot, for example. I know whether I'm in pain or not. So uh, Schopenhauer thinks that this inner access, so to speak, to the body uh, is a form of non-representational knowledge, which therefore can bypass the Kantian prohibition. And it works, he says, as an access to, uh, to the citadel of the uh, in itself, 
And if I focus on this um, intuitive um, access to my body, then what I discover, he thinks, is that I'm nothing but a set of desires and drives. And these desires and drives he calls uh, the will. And then in book two of his major uh, opus, The World is Will and Representation, he proceeds to extend this insight to the whole world. So not just our bodies, not just us, but everything in the phenomenal world is what he calls an objectification of the will. And he has, so for animals, for example, they, like us, have desires. They want to live fundamentally. Plants try to grow. Uh, and he even comes up with interesting examples like crystals, which are for him halfway between the mineral and the, uh, the vegetal world, and who also sh which also show an aspiration to grow. So he comes to this conclusion, anti Kantian conclusion that it is possible to know uh, the, inince, the noumenal world, although not through representational knowledge, and its name, its essence, is will. That was terrific.